Okay, so today we will talk about infinite games and then if time permits we will talk about uh, continuous kernel games. So what are infinite games? We saw an example last in the last class in the net game right and the example was a was a matrix in 2 cross the space of natural numbers right so we had infinite number of uh, actions for the other player and what we saw we, what we saw there was that uh, we observed that there is a value there is a value but but no q star which is uh, the column player so for column player there was no q star that can achieve the value okay so for the column player there was no uh, mixed strategy whatsoever that could achieve the value of the game. So this uh, motivates us to define a weaker concept than Nash equilibrium, which is epsilon Nash equilibrium. Okay, so what's an definition of epsilon Nash equilibrium? How do you think we should define it? So let's say A, uh, let's say A1 is the action set of player 1, A2 is the action set of player 2, okay, uh, and C1 which is a function from A1 cross A2 to R is the cost of player 1 and same thing C2 A1 cross A2 to R cost of player 2. So how should we define epsilon Nash equilibrium? So let's say a1 star epsilon, A2 star epsilon is an epsilon Nash if or if and only if any thoughts how should we go about defining an equilibrium for this class of problems? Yeah. Well, you know, right now I'm just talking about A1 and A2, okay? We'll put it in P and Q later on for a specific problem. Actually, I should just write, uh, I want it to be N player, okay? So let's, let's do it for two players and for N players, you will be able to extend it. So for two players in this particular setting, how would you define it? Let so the game value would be an epsilon away from the other. There's no value. So in, in here, there was a value of the so this was a zero sum game, right? But now I'm considering non zero sum game. I'm not making any restriction of zero sum. There is no value here. So in, okay. So in general, in non zero sum, you don't call anything a value because there's no value. Okay. So maybe there's no even like a cost for player one that he can achieve absolutely. Well, you can say that the equilibrium payoff. Okay. What we call an equilibrium payoff is the value, so we call it value in zero sum game, but for non zero sum game, we'll call it an equilibrium payoff or equilibrium cost. Okay, so we are epsilon away from the equilibrium payoff. No, I want the exact expression. Okay, so C1 of A1, uh, Joe, you cannot answer this question. <laughs> 
Okay, so this is my equilibrium payoff. Okay, what 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 should it be less than equal to? Or oh, strictly less than? <laughs> C1 of A1, A2 star epsilon plus epsilon for all A1 in A1. Okay? So the equilibrium cost at epsilon Nash equilibrium has to be less than, strictly less than, the cost with A2 strategy fixed. A1 can pick any strategy, A1, or any action A1 plus epsilon. Okay, so there is a margin of error here. And same thing for C2, A1 star epsilon, A2 star epsilon is less than C2, A1 star epsilon, A2 plus epsilon for every A2 in A2. Okay, so that's the definition of epsilon Nash. And so, for zero sum case, zero sum uh, by matrix game, my A1 is delta M, A2 is delta infinity, and C1 is P transpose A cube. And C2 is also P transpose AQ. Uh, well, it should be negative. Yes? So we fix the epsilon before talking about the yes, epsilon Nash. Yes, that's right. So we fix epsilon before we talk about epsilon Nash. Uh, so uh, when we talk about when we talk about uh, algorithmic game theory, uh, epsilon will be a parameter. So if you want your epsilon to be 0 0.01, the algorithm is going to take a lot longer than epsilon equals 0 0.1. Lot. <laughs> okay. So uh, so in this case, we say that p epsilon q epsilon is epsilon saddle point equilibrium. P epsilon transpose A Q epsilon. Remember, this A could be an infinite cross infinite game. Okay, so A could be a matrix and infinite cross. Oh, I have already written A two as. Okay, let's make it delta n. So n could be infinity and m could be infinity. So this should be less than P transpose A Q epsilon plus epsilon and p epsilon transpose a q epsilon should be greater than p epsilon transpose a q minus epsilon I'm making sure that what I have written is correct. Yes. That's fine. This is correct. Okay. So in the example that we studied, we had so p epsilon was p star, okay, because it was it was I mean player 2 had very uh Sorry, player one, the row player had an exact matrix. There was no ambiguity whatsoever. He could play the, the P star. But for player two, he could not play Q star because that put a lot of weight on the infinity action. So he has to act according to Q epsilon. Okay? And Q epsilon will be an epsilon Nash for this particular, or epsilon saddle point equilibrium for that particular uh, problem. Okay, is that is that clear? Yes. Oh, that's a good point. 
Uh, so his, his question is, is there any merit for Epsilon to be different for the two players? You know, that's an interesting formulation. I haven't thought about it. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has thought about it because I've always seen Epsilon Nash. I've never seen Epsilon 1 and Epsilon 2. But that's an important thought. I mean, you can probably pursue that for, uh, for the game theory project. <laughs> What's the benefit <laughs> of having different Epsilon? I don't know. Uh, So for zero-sum games, we have an important result. The theorem is uh, two person zero-sum game has a finite value if and only if for every epsilon greater than 0 there exists an epsilon saddle point equilibrium. By the way, I, I did not notice, uh, noted here that epsilon is greater than 0, but since we are in ECE department, epsilon is always strictly greater than 0. Okay, there is no ambiguity there. So two-person zero-sum game has a finite value if and only if for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists an epsilon saddle point equilibrium. Any any questions so far on the definition of epsilon Nash and this theorem? I'm not going to prove the theorem. I'll move ahead, and I'll talk about uh, the lower value and the upper value. So V bar, which is uh, I think security, what was it called? Security value? Security value for uh, the, this is the security value for the maximizer. So, for maximizer. So, V bar M is SUP over Q in delta N in in P in delta M and then P transpose AQ. And M and N could be infinity. Same thing, security value for the minimizer is V bar M. M stands for mixed strategies here, okay? It's inf soup P in delta M, Q in delta N, P transpose AQ. Okay, so for every, uh, so this is the security value for the maximizer. So if the maximizer fixes his strategy Q, uh, then he can get P transpose AQ, inf of P transpose AQ at its maximum, uh, maximum uh, as, as its value. And then if he takes the maximum over, not the maximum, the supremum over all such Qs, all such mixed strategies that it can take, it will secure this amount of value for the maximizer. But and in this case, the maximizer is the column player, right? So if A is the cost matrix for low player, then maximizer is the column player. Uh, so that's good. But are all of you familiar with this idea of supremum and infimum? How many of you are not familiar with the idea of supremum and infimum? OK, a few people. So let me, uh, let me try and tell you what supremum and infimum is uh, very, very quickly because that's not the 
point of this uh, this lecture. But here is a thought. I want to uh, minimize, or I want to min yeah. Let me write it as minimize, even though it may be mathematically incorrect. E raised to x for x in R. Okay. So I come to you and I ask you that I want to minimize e raised to x for where x is in R. So what should you come and tell me? What is it that you would come and tell me? For this, if I, if I come and tell you that I want to solve this problem, what should you reply? Is it, is it solvable? No? Why do you say no? Right, where do you stop? You can't find a minimum, right? Because if you look at it, e raised to x is always greater than or equal to 0, but e raised to minus infinity is equal to 0. But there is no way you can find. So basically, infinity is not part of r. It's not part of the real number, right? So this problem itself doesn't make sense. Okay, It doesn't make sense because there is no minimizer of the optimization problem that I gave you. Okay, so in this case, you say that, so you want to inf of f of x, so let's say a, uh, a is already used. Uh, f, is, f is not used, uh, what should I, r, okay, thanks. r, x is in some set x, so r is infimum, if and only if there exist, if and only if for every epsilon greater than 0, there exist x epsilon in x such that f of x epsilon is less than r plus epsilon. Okay? <laughs> So that's the definition of infimum. So let's say, what is the infimum of e raised to x for x in r? Zero. OK, why am I claiming zero? Because for every epsilon greater than zero, I can define x epsilon to be half of log of epsilon such that e raised to x epsilon is less than epsilon. No, not half, actually. Uh, maybe 2. 2 log epsilon, yeah. So this is the natural log, OK? So, but I can't say that negative of 1 is infimum of e raised to x, right? Because if I pick an epsilon very small, so I can't say, where do I write? OK. So I can't say minus 1 equals to inf of e raised to x, because I can pick epsilon equals to 1 over, one over 2. Right? Uh, if I pick epsilon equals to 1 over 2, I know that I cannot find, can't find x epsilon such that e raised to x epsilon is less than negative 1 over 2, or negative 1 plus epsilon equals negative 1 over 2. OK? Can't find it. So. So that's why 0 is the infimum of e raised to x. It's the minimum value. It's the minimum value so that if you increase it a little bit, you will always be able to find an x epsilon that's having a value below that r plus uh, epsilon. Okay? And same thing with supremum. So you can define a supremum in an analogous way. So r equals to sup of x in x, f of x, if and only if, 
for every epsilon greater than 0, there exists an x epsilon in x such that f of x epsilon is greater than r minus epsilon. Okay, that's the definition of uh, supremum. And in the bracket, I will say take math 5, 2, 0, 1. <laughs> okay, uh, if you want to know more about it. Uh, so, anyway, so we are taking supremum over all q because we don't know whether a maximum would exist. If we knew that n and m are all finite numbers, then we would know that this can be max and this can be min because they would exist. But since we are assuming that m and n can be infinity, we don't know whether a maximum would exist. So, therefore, we are calling it supremum. So, supremum over all q over all mixed strategies of the maximizer, infimum over all mixed strategies of the minimizer of uh, the expected cost. Okay, so if uh, if v bar m, if the security values are the same, then it implies that v, the value of the game exists and that's equal to, okay? So if the two values are equal, if the two security values are equal, then the value of the game exists for the zero sum game and it's equal to the security values of the players. Okay, so any question? No? Okay, so let's say I give you a zero person game in which one act, one player had the, the, the action space of one player was the entire set of natural numbers, whereas the other player had finite number of actions. Let's say I give you that game. How would we know whether a value for that game exists or not? What do you think should be the conditions we should impose on the game so as to prove that a value in such a game would exist? So it's a semi-infinite, it's called semi-infinite game. So one player has infinite number of actions, the other player has finite number of actions. theorem, I am considering a two person semi infinite by matrix non zero sum game. Okay, <laughs> the topic itself took the entire board. Okay. Uh, so I'm looking at two-person semi-infinite bimatrix non-zero sum game. Uh, so one of the players has infinite number of actions available, and my question is, when would there be an when would there be an epsilon Nash equilibrium in mixed strategies for this particular game? What should we uh, what should we impose on the cost function? So a and b, so a and b are the cost matrices. Yeah. Maybe you can ask them to be bounded. Bounded? Okay, so let's uh, assume, assume that, so you want them to be uniformly bounded or you just want them to be bounded? You know what's the difference between uniformly bounded and bounded is? No? No? Oh, yes. No? Okay. So, you want A, I, J and B, I, J to be bounded. Okay. So, let's say, uh, okay, don't, don't write this, don't write this part. 
So let's say my Aij is equal to j, i plus j. So this is bounded. For every ij, i plus j is bounded, right? But what does it not satisfy? It goes to infinity, yeah. right? So uniformly bounded. So you want uniform, uniformly bounded matrices. So what you want is this should be uniformly bounded, okay? Which means that a i j absolute value b i j should be less than or equal to some number m, okay? For all i j. So there is a constant so that every entries of these matrices should be less than or equal to that constant. Okay, so you want uniformly bounded condition. Okay, so you this is all you need. This is all you need. Then there exists a there exists an epsilon Nash equilibrium in mixed strategies. Okay, I'll, uh, I don't want to cover the proof, uh, not because it's difficult, but it requires some ideas from math 5201, uh, which I don't want to recall. Besides infimum and supremum, I don't want to recall other concepts. But anyone who has taken math 5201, can you tell me how would you, how would you prove this result? Anyone who has taken real analysis, how would you go about proving this result? Any thoughts? No? Okay, so you, uh, what you do is you construct a smaller matrix A and B n. So for every epsilon greater than zero, you find, find a matrix Finite matrix. Uh, uh, you know, this is semi infinite matrix, so I want to find a finite matrix, so I'll just write it as finite matrices A n epsilon and B n epsilon. Okay? And what do we know from Nash's result? So this is the proof. This is the proof idea. Okay? So for every epsilon greater than zero, you find, uh, you come up with a finite matrix A n epsilon, B n epsilon. So it's a finite matrix. So what do we know? An equilibrium always exists from Nash's result. Okay. So we know the equilibrium exists in this particular game, and then you augment that equilibrium with zeros in order to make sure that you are filling up all the strategies. Uh, so you augment it with zeros and then you prove that that is indeed an epsilon Nash. So let me tell you what the construction is. So say P n epsilon, so let's say a is in R m cross infinity, B is in R m cross infinity. So uh, the second player has infinite number of actions. And then I compute this A n epsilon, B n epsilon. And let's say it's the, it's constructed without loss of generality, you can construct it using, or you don't even have to, yeah, this is A n epsilon. So this A n epsilon will be a matrix R m cross n epsilon, and B n epsilon will be a matrix R m cross n epsilon. And you will find the equilibrium P epsilon 
and q epsilon or q epsilon tilde would be the equilibrium for this game is Nash. So this is exact Nash equilibrium of And then you define p star or p epsilon uh, star to be p tilde epsilon, and you define q star epsilon to be q n epsilon star 0, 0, 0. OK, and this is epsilon Nash equilibrium. Okay, so you augment this probability vector with all zeros, okay, all the way to infinity, and you prove that that is an epsilon Nash equilibrium. Okay, is the result uh, is the idea clear? Yes. N epsilon, that uh, requires some amount of real analysis. So have you taken real analysis? You're taking it now. Have you studied compact sets? Uh, so have you studied this theorem which says every, compact, every open covering of a compact set has a finite subcover? OK. So what you do is you essentially cover. So remember, the space of payoffs uh, or, or cost function, they are all in a compact set. right? So what you do is you use these these vectors, uh, which is, you s remember, this is an infinite matrix, right? This is an infinite matrix. And these vectors are all in a compact set. So you cover this compact set by epsilon balls of uh, around these vectors. So this is C1, this is C2, this is C3, C4, right? So you cover the entire space, uh, which is less than or equal to M with an epsilon cover of these uh, vectors, and then you extract a finite subcover out of it. And the center point of those finite subcovers would become the, the columns of the matrix A n epsilon and B n epsilon. Okay? So that's the idea. Okay? But remember that extracting that finite subcover is not a, I mean, it's not an analytical task. It's an existence result, but we don't know how to extract a finite subcover out of the open covering of a compact set. Okay, so that's a that's a problem. I don't know how to be how how to deal with it. Okay, but that's the idea. Okay, so those of you who haven't taken five two zero one, this should encourage you to take five two zero one. Okay, but uh, uh, but. But even if you don't want to take it, it's fine. You don't have to understand the proof of this result. All you need to know is that in semi-infinite games, as long as the cost is uniformly bounded, you have an epsilon Nash equilibrium. And it may not be easy to compute that epsilon Nash equilibrium. Okay? Uh, but what is an outcome of this, of this result? What is the corollary of this result for zero-sum game? So, Corollary. What is a corollary? Remember what we had written. A value in a zero sum game would exist if and only if for every epsilon greater than zero an epsilon saddle point equilibrium exists. Right? So we know that in semi infinite game, as long as you have bounded cost, uniformly bounded cost, uh, an epsilon Nash exists. Therefore, for zero sum game, semi infinite value exists. Okay, semi-infinite zero-sum game, value always exists. Okay, so what's the, so what happens in the, in infinite game, so you're not, you're not semi-infinite, both the players have infinite number of actions. Any thoughts? Yeah. 
yeah, we don't have these results. <laughs> okay, so for for infinite games, uh, there is a there is a counter example, which I'm going to show now. So, infinite zero sum game, this is infinite. Okay, so I want to have one zero minus one zero zero zero, zero one zero minus one zero zero zero, zero zero one zero minus one zero zero. Okay, so this goes. 0 all the way, 0 all the way, and you can keep repeating this thing. And you will see that the lower value, negative 1, the upper value, positive 1, okay, and so the value doesn't exist. Okay, these two things are not equal, therefore the value will never exist in infinite zero sum game. Okay, but uh, semi infinite value exists. So we are all happy. Any questions so far? Okay, so now we want to talk about uh, a continuous kernel games where the actions remember in these case you have discrete number of actions right you have discrete actions you can do 1 2 3 4 5 okay now i'm going to talk about cases where you have a continuous number of actions which are quite widely used in controls problem as well as in economic problems so to to give you an example how much water you can take out from the river okay if you are two states you have a single river passing through two states and you want to divide the water Okay, Jayant is very smiling because he knows that this is a problem of uh, uh, this is a problem among many states across the world. Okay, so you have two states. There is a single river. It has a lot of water. It has a lot of fish. Okay, and you want to extract the water. So the amount of water is a continuous variable, right? It's not a discrete variable. Uh, so how much water can you can one state take out from that river? Okay. Uh, so that's one case. The second case is you are driving a car. Uh, what should be the steering angle? Okay, that's a continuous variable. Uh, if you are flying a plane, again you have a lot of continuous variables: roll, pitch, yaw, uh, angle of attacks, and so on. So there are lot, lot of different uh, control problems have infinite number of continuously infinite number of actions. So we'll talk about those kind of games. So this is called continuous kernel game. You know, price in economics is also a continuous variable, even though we only see discrete values, uh, but it's continuous. Okay. Uh, so the setting is A1, or let, let me call it U1, which is the action set of first player, and it is a subset of Rm1. U2 is a subset of Rm2, and so on. Un is a subset of Rmn. Okay? And I have a cost function. So these are action sets. And then I have cost functions. So C1, which is a function from U1 cross Un to R, Cn, U1 cross Un to R. A lot of cost functions.
Okay, so what is a Nash equilibrium? So U1 star U n star is Nash equilibrium if C i U i star U minus i star is less than or equal to C i U i U minus i star for all U i in U i. So that was an easy definition. Okay, but now let's talk about what is known as reaction curve. So this is something we can talk about in in these kind of games, continuous kernel games. So it's the best response. Okay, so it's called reaction curve. I I don't quite know what the what is the reason why it's called reaction curve and not best response because it's exactly the same. Maybe there is some historical reason behind it, and I don't know what the reason is. But in reaction curves, you say R i u of minus i is the set of u i in u i such that C i u i u minus i equals to n over u i in u i. No, u in u i C i u minus i. Okay, so given the actions of other players, what are the set of best responses that are that is available to you? Okay, and it could be empty. Reaction curves could be empty. Can be empty. Okay, so this is known as reaction curve, and this is how it would look like. So let's say this is my u1 space, this is my u2 space, and I draw two reaction curves. This is my R1 u2, this is my R2 u1. So if I pick my u2, some u2 here. This is my best response u1. No. Uh, if I pick a u2 here, then this is my best response. Uh, no, this is r2, right? So this is my best response for player one. And if I pick u1, then this would be my best response for player two. Okay. So now my question is, which point in this diagram? Is a Nash equilibrium. Okay, <laughs> very simple answer. So this is my Nash equilibrium, right? So this and this. So this is my U1 star, and this is my U2 star because they are best responses of each other. Uh, okay. So we could also have cases where. The reaction curves are like this. So this is my R1 of U2, and this is my R2 of U1. In which case, there is no Nash equilibrium, right? Because the reaction curves don't meet. And I could have a case uh, I could also have a case where The reaction curves look like this, like a DNA, okay? And so we have multiple Nash equilibrium. One here, right? All these intersection points are Nash equilibrium. So in general, <coughs> U1 star all the way up to UN star is a Nash equilibrium if the reaction curves meet at that point, okay? Equivalent definition. So they are all best responses of each other. Now, one thing to note here is, okay, one thing to note here is the following. Let's say,
Let's say we don't know what a Nash equilibrium is in this particular game. Okay, so player one picks an action. What's the player two's best response? That's this. Okay, player two picks an action. What's player one's best response? This. Okay, then player one takes an action. The best response will be this. Then player two will take an action. The best response is this. Okay, so eventually what happens? If they keep taking best responses of each other, they converge, right? They converge to the Nash equilibrium. It may not be the case here, okay? So, uh, if u1 takes, the, so I haven't defined, okay, if u1 takes this, then u2 will take this, then u1 will take this. Okay, so in some cases, if this, if this curve was oriented in a different fashion, this iteration may not converge. Okay, so there are cases where the Nash equilibrium is stable, and there are cases stable for this particular map, this best response, iterative best response map, and then there are cases where this Nash equilibrium may or may not be, may not be stable. That is, these iterative maps do not converge to the equilibrium. They keep cycling. Uh, actually, I have a very good example for the cycling part. So let's say your reaction curves were like this, okay? Two straight lines. Then you start from here, then you go here, then you go here, then here, and then you keep cycling. You don't converge to the Nash equilibrium, right? So there are cases like that. Uh, so we need to design algorithms carefully for coming up with Nash equilibrium. So let's look at some existence result. Yeah. Uh, isn't it the same thing as the vicious play in the moment? Which one? Uh, the, the best response of each player at the action migration. Yes. The... Yes. So in fictitious play, we had exactly this this iteration. The action set was finite. Then. Yes. So actions were finite, but the distributions were infinite. So if you look at it from the infinite distribution idea, or if you look at it that way, then it's always converging. It's trying to move towards this stable point, which is the saddle point equilibrium. Okay, and if uh, in a finite game, and we have a pure strategy in equilibrium, could it be the same thing with this response to each player? No, convert? no. So, okay, so you're talking about pure strategy in Nash equilibrium. I don't know, there is no theorem as such which says that if you are, if you just, ha if you have a pure strategy Nash equilibrium in a game, then this best response map will converge to that equilibrium. I haven't seen any theorem of that sort. Sometimes I tried it, and it converges. And okay. It's similar to this idea. It's basically the same. You want to pursue it for your project? Oh, I did something else. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know whether uh, uh, what you're saying would hold true in this case or not. Because see, if you're looking at it from in the, in the space of distributions over the actions, you're essentially saying that the equilibrium is, is a vertex of the simplex, right? So you have this simplex, and a pure strategy equilibrium means this one and this one is in Nash equilibrium. Uh, I wonder why an iterative best response would converge to these two points. Um, why would that hold true? I don't know. Okay, may or may not be true in general. Um, but the existence result is as follows. So, uh, let me so there are two existence results. I don't know whether I should introduce them separately. Let's introduce them separately. So the first result, theorem one, CI assume UI convex 
for all i and c i u minus i is convex for all u minus i in capital U minus i and i. Okay, so if I fix the actions of other players and I look at this function ci as a function of ui, then it is convex. It's a convex function. Then there exists a Nash equilibrium u1 star u1 star. Okay? And the proof is Kakutani fixed point theorem. And we will not study that. So Kakutani fixed point theorem is a generalization of Brouwer fixed point theorem. So convexity is a very nice property, but you don't want the cost function to be convex in other players' action. All you want is convex in ith players' action. So ci should be convex in ui for every fixed u minus i. Okay, all that is all that you need. So if you think about it, uh, if you imagine, let's. Uh, Let's look at it. So if you imagine C1 equals P transpose A Q or C1 P Q and C2 P Q equals P transpose B Q, right? So my U1 is equal to delta M, U2 equals to delta N. So U1 and U2 are convex. And for each fixed Q, C1 is convex in P. For each fixed P, C2 is convex in Q, right? So there is a Nash equilibrium from uh, this result. The other result in similar spirit is Rosen's theorem. This was proved in 1965, where the setting is slightly different. Okay, the setting is, I have a set U, which is a subset of R M1 cross R M N. Okay. So in some sense, your actions are not completely decoupled from each other. Okay, so in this case, each UI was distinct. So, so there was no uh, there was no problem. I could pick an action without worrying about what action you are going to pick. But now that's not the case. Okay, in in the in the setting for Rosen's theorem. So what what I'm saying is maybe you have a constraint something like u1 plus u2 has to be less than or equal to 10. So if there is 10 gallons of water and you are playing a game, uh, u1 plus u2 has to be at most 10 gallons of water. Okay, you can't, yeah, you, you can't produce water at that moment. So you have constraints of this type, okay, so zero, and then you have constraints like u1 greater than or equal to zero, u2 greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so that defines the set. capital U. And then Rosen's, Rosen's theorem also assumes the fact that CI is convex. So we, we assume that U is convex and we assume that CI U minus I is convex. 
in ui for every u minus i for every i. And what he proves is there exists a Nash equilibrium. So you can see why Rosen's theorem is important, right? Because there are many, many problems where you have resource constraint, and it has to be shared among multiple users. One example is spectrum. You have certain bandwidth, and you want to share it among n users. So there is a constraint, right? If it is 10 gigabits per second, uh, each one, you can give each one 1 gigabits per second. There are 10 users. You can give each one 10 gigabits per second. Oh, sorry, 1 gigabit per second, or you can give 1, 5 gigabits and others you can divide it equally or you can come up with many other uh, combinations right so your constraint set is convex but there are you can't pick one action unilaterally as was the case in the earlier case so there is some constraint underlying constraint that will uh, that'll be uh, that'll be imposed on the set of actions but as long as the set is convex you are good okay so Sorry? I mean, is this a, a simultaneous movie? I mean, it can't be a simultaneous movie. Time? Yeah. There's no concept of time right now. We are still in the static game situation. But, I mean, how, do, how does U1 know whether U2 will, like, I mean, right. this strategy is uh, ethical or not? Maybe. Yeah, but everyone is going to play according to a Nash equilibrium, right? If that is the case. I mean, uh, I understand your point. Your point is, I cannot, if I cannot choose unilaterally, how am I going to make a choice, right? But it turns out that there is a Nash equilibrium. So in that case, there is some sort of stability because I have to pick what is a Nash equilibrium strategy for me. Yes. Are there, could there be multiple Nash equilibriums? Are there? Yes. So it doesn't say anything about uniqueness so far. So then what if there are multiple ones with the same? You, we are in the same situation. You have multiple equilibrium. Which one you, would you choose? So you use one of the refinements of Nash equilibrium. Either you use stable equilibrium, perfect equilibrium, proper equilibrium. Although I don't know whether those concepts have been extended to these classes of games or not. But that's certainly a problem that is worth studying. Uh, whether there would be a so perfect, proper, and all those equilibrium concepts have been well defined, well studied for finite games and for games in extensive form. But for these classes of games, I haven't seen any papers. Uh, that doesn't mean there may not be, but I just haven't seen it. Uh, but here is the cool part, which is, so I pick a R, N, R, N. So N is the number of players. N is the number of players. So I pick a value, a vector R in Rn, and I define this matrix G of x r as r1 gradient with respect to u1 of c1, r2 gradient of, not x, sorry, G of u1, un, comma r, c2, rn gradient with respect to un of cn, And let's say G of U comma R, uh, let me define U to be U1, UN. Can someone tell me what the dimension of this vector is? What's the dimension of this vector? So what is gradient of C1 with respect to U1? How, how many dimensions does that vector have? Remember that U is a subset of Rm1. So Rm1 is the action space of 
player 1, Rmn is the action space of player n. So what is this uh, summation of m1 to mn, right? R of summation m1 to mn, so this is a vector. So, so remember, u is also a vector in the same space. So u and g of u comma r, they are vectors in r m1 plus mn, OK? And now I'm going to define g of u comma r as gradient of u of g, u comma r plus gradient u of g, u comma r transpose. Okay, so the next result is, anyone can guess what the next result should be? No? Who wants to guess? Okay, so Rosen's theorem number two, if g of u comma r is strictly positive definite for all u in capital U, then there exists a unique, oh, uh, not if g of, sorry, if there exists an r, theorem 2, if there exists an r in Rn such that g of u comma r is strictly positive for all u, is strictly positive definite. So this is positive definite. Okay, so if g of u comma r is strictly positive definite for all u in u, then there exists a unique Nash equilibrium. Okay, so now you know how to act. So this, uh, so in the space of reaction curves, if you think about it, in the space of reaction curves, in the earlier case, in the previous case, you could have situation where the reaction curve is like this and like this. Okay, so there is this band of Nash equilibrium. Okay, but now if this condition holds, then the reaction curves have a unique point at which they meet. Okay, and so that's the Nash equilibrium. Now, I have to admit that, I mean, this is an important and very nice result because it says that there is going to be a unique Nash equilibrium. In fact, uh, this is only one sufficient condition. There is other sufficient conditions under which you can prove uniqueness of Nash equilibrium. Uh, this one is the most easy to check condition. But uh, the problem is I haven't been able to find a good algorithm so far which can iteratively compute the unique Nash equilibrium, assuming that this, assuming that this holds. So there is an algorithm in Rosen's paper, original paper, written in 1965, uh, but it has some, some problem. Uh, it requires some amount of cooperation among the agents, right? So as to not violate the constraint, right? The constraint because their actions are constrained to each other. So it requires some amount of cooperation among the agents. The learning algorithm that he has devised requires some sort of cooperation. Or in other words, it requires the agents to agree on the Lagrange multipliers while updating their actions. Uh, so that's something that I, I, I don't know whether that's a, that's a constraint that can be removed or it has to be that way. Okay, so that's something that is TBD, I don't know. Okay, because the action sets are constrained, you have to agree on the Lagrange multipliers at every point of time. All players have to agree on the Lagrange multipliers. Um, 
maybe some of you can come up with specific examples in communications or in resource allocation or problems of that type where you can get away with that that assumption that you all of them have to agree on the Lagrange multiplier at every point of time when they are updating their their estimate of Nash equilibrium okay does that make sense is it clear So that's a continuous kernel game. And uh, what else? Oh, yes. So now, uh, if there is no question, then I want to go uh, and talk about, then I want to talk about learning in continuous kernel game. Any question? Yes. Uh, so if you are in convex situation, if your cost is convex in your action, uh, there is no reason for you to go to mixed strategies, okay? Because you always have a pure strategy equilibrium that will give you the best possible cost. But for general case where the cost function is bounded and the action set is compact, there is an existence result which says that a mixed strategy equilibrium will always exist. So define yes, you define probability distribution over compact sets, and then you say that well, uh, it's. Uh, I mean, it's a compact, it's a weak star compact set in the space of probability distribution. If you're familiar with functional analysis, you would know what a weak star compact set is. So it's a weak star compact set. The cost function is continuous, so there exists. And then you don't use Kakutani fixed point theorem. You use something else. It's called Glicksberg fixed point theorem, which is a generalization of Kakutani fixed point theorem. So you use that to prove that, well, everything works out and there exists a mixed strategy equilibrium. But nobody uses it. Okay, it just proves the existence of equilibrium. Uh, there are other existence results. One of them was proven in uh, 1999 by Philip Rainey, who is an economist, mathematical economist. And that proved, that dis defined a class of games where under certain condition, a pure strategy Nash equilibrium would exist. Okay? And the reason why that is important is when you are auctioning, somebody made the rules. Okay, and there are 20 players who are putting in their auction. I have a valuation for the product. I have seeing an art piece. I have a valuation for that art piece. And Joe is sitting there. He also has a valuation for that art piece. Okay, and everyone of us have valuation for that art piece. How should I bid? Okay, so one could argue that well, you know, everything is compact. I don't have a lot of money. Joe also probably doesn't have a lot of money. <laughs> so it's all compact action space. So the price will be a mixed strategy over the entire you know worth entire worth that i have or he has or whatever you guys have right but that's not that's not very good that's not uh, intuitively appealing so what you would want to say is well there exists a unique uh, map that maps the valuation to the price or it, it's a it's a yeah so the bid is not uh, it's pure it's a pure strategy in some sense, right? Yeah, so it's a number. It's not a distribution over the space of prices. So, so there it becomes useful. And I'll get back to it towards the end of the course, OK? Phillips uh, fixed point theorem. Uh, no, Rainey's fixed point theorem. And then there is further generalization of Rainey's fixed point theorem and so on. So we'll get to it towards the end of the course. OK, uh, next topic is learning. So any questions on this? No. Okay. So learning. Learning in continuous kernel game so i am given a game okay with uh, action sets as u1 u2 u3 all up to un and then i am given my cost function so everyone has everybody else's cost function and the question is we want to go through some sort of fictitious play kind of behavior so as to update our action which will converge eventually to a nash equilibrium so let's say two players And I have two different 
iteration, the first iteration says that, well, u 2k is going to be the best response of player 2 with respect to u 1k and u 1, sorry, u 2k plus 1. And u 1 k plus 1 is going to be the best response of player 2 at time k. Okay? This is known as simultaneous update. Okay? This is u 2 u2k. The other update mechanism, so remember this is the best response, right? This is the best response map. Uh, the other, or I can put an inclusion sign here because I don't know whether these are set valued or or has a, a singleton. So let me put an inclusion. So that's one way of updating it. It's simultaneous update. I look at, so if I'm player two, I look at your action at the past time step and I update my action accordingly. You look at my action at the past time step and then you update accordingly and this is called simultaneous update. Then you have a sequential update where u2 k plus 1 is r2 or it's in u1 k and then u1 k plus 1 is in r1 u2 k plus 1. Okay, so this is another method of uh, updating it. So player two updates first, and then player one updates, looking at the action of player two. So it turns out that when you are looking at continuous kernel games, and this will be an assignment problem, it'll turn out that in some cases, this update st scheme would converge to a Nash equilibrium, whereas this would not converge or this would converge to a Nash equilibrium and this would not converge. In other words, the sequence in which the players update their action in response to the actions of the other players may or may not lead to convergence in continuous kernel game. Okay, so that's, that's an important point. And the reason for that is, if you look at this expression, you have u1 k plus 1 equals R1 O R2 U1 K, no U1 K minus 1 and same thing for this U2 K plus 1 okay this is the composite map this is the composite learning scheme in this simultaneous update case whereas in this case U1 k plus 1 equals r1 o r2 u2 no u1 k okay so starting with arbitrary choices and same thing you can write same thing for u2 of k plus 1 as well okay so this map this composite map may or may not be stable okay so depending upon parameters, depending upon the learning speed, depending upon the update scheme, if this is not stable, you will never converge to the equilibrium point, right? Same thing here, if this is not stable, you will never converge to the equilibrium point. So, so in general, it's a fairly, uh, I mean, so if you're trying to do learning or if you're trying to update your action in continuous kernel game, you have to design this sequence of steps carefully so as to ensure that the algorithm is going to converge. Okay, and what is the best method to come up with that uh, update scheme? So in other words, how would you prove that such an iterative method would converge to an equilibrium or not? What's the, what's the best iterative fixed point theorem that we have in life. If it's a contraction map, right? So you can apply Banach contraction mapping theorem to prove that it'll converge to the fixed point. So, so in other words, the learning scheme or the update scheme
So you want, so you will come up with this update scheme from u to u, right? So this would be something like this, how you update your actions. So t will be a function from u to u. And what you want to prove, and it might depend on some parameter p, OK? That will be the learning parameter. So p is some parameter, some learning. parameter, OK? And what you need to prove is that tp of u1, or not u1, u minus tp of u bar is less than or equal to alpha of u minus u bar, where alpha is a number between 0 and 1. 1 is not included in the set. So this is a contraction map. Okay, so the update, which might depend on some learning parameter, has to be a contraction map. And if it is a contraction map, then you are good to go. You will converge to the equilibrium. If it is not a contraction map, it reduce or increase the parameter values so as to make sure that it becomes a contraction map uh, in, in some time, um, I mean, by changing the parameter. And it will converge. So I'll give you an assignment where you will play with these parameters, okay, and you will prove that under some learning schemes, it doesn't convert. With the same parameter, under this scheme, it will not convert. But under this scheme, it will converge. Okay? And then you change the parameter. And under this scheme, it becomes convergent. But I don't remember whether in this scheme it will converge or not. But anyways, there are ways of making sure that this scheme converges. There are ways of making sure that this scheme would converge for two, three, or multiple player games. Okay? So that's it for this class. Uh, We'll talk about